I want to talk about Blue Murder. I want to talk about old Blue Murder. I want to talk about new Blue Murder, now Blue Murder. It's a two-parter. You can watch it on Plus 7. It was aired a few weeks ago. Blue Murder gives us the most recent iteration of the life and crimes of Roger Rogerson. I like the way you did that, life and crimes. Did you? Nice, yeah. That's yeah, good. Thanks, man. So, Roger Rogerson is a disgraced cop and currently serving probably the rest of his life in jail for murder. This series does not exactly pick up where the last one left off, the last one being Blue Murder, made in 1995, but it features, of course, Richard Roxburgh as the charismatic, deadly detective Roger Rogerson. I was so excited about this, Carl. Why? When it first came out in 1995, Mm. it was the most shocking, horrifying, exciting television I'd ever seen in my life. Mm. Mm. It had... Many Australian actors who had hitherto been perhaps not challenged, not, not, not overly challenged in their thespic muscles. Thespic muscles, where do they sit in the, <laughs> the and human physique? Actors, actors like Peter Phelps, Steve Bastonioni, uh, Gary Sweet. Tony Martin. All actors mm. who, who I had only seen in comical roles on yeah. advertisements for soap operas. And, and they were all magnificent. The show was about Roger Rogerson. He was a detective. He worked in armed hold-up and drugs. He was based in Darlinghurst. He ruled Sydney as, as a teenager in the 1980s, growing up and going out in Sydney. Everybody was well aware of his presence. So you grew up in Sydney. Did you see him? Did you no, see him on the street? No, I didn't see him on the street. And, and one would have gone out of one's way not to see him yeah, on the street. Yeah. Not just him and the men that he consorted with it was it was the kind of place where if if you wanted to you could certainly run into people like him and and his various colleagues if you didn't want to you you know you you're well to. advised not you to. were well advised not to mm-hmm. exactly it it sets us it the the show is a two-parter the, the first one from 1995 it traces the uh, various murders and drug deals and corruption and crimes that Rogerson was involved in. It is absolutely gripping. Did you go back and rewatch it? Have you? Oh, not recently. I've watched it about twenty times. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. yeah. I saw Ian David, who wrote the the screenplay for it. He doesn't write this screenplay. Mm. It's the same director, though, Michael Jenkins. Michael Jenkins. Yeah. Uh, Peter Shrek writes the screenplay for this this current one. This is Shrek the Fourth, I think, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Um, he he was at the film festival talking about the whole what how how he wrote it and. He, he'd say at various times his producer would advise him to go on a trip for a couple of weeks because he'd gotten very close in his investigations and his producer had heard that maybe it would be a little dangerous for him to be out and about. St- stationary. Knocking on doors, <laughs> standing in front of milk bars with yeah, a big right. target on his chest. And at one point, Bob Ellis rises up. Not, he was still alive then, so he didn't rise from the grave. Rises up from the balcony and with his, you know, how he would speak with his chin on his yeah. chest and his glasses round his neck. So, so it's closer to the hip flask, I think. Yeah. That was the, that was the rationale there. <laughs> and Ian David's sitting there, you know, taking questions, and Bob Ellis says, "How do you deal with the fear? <laughs> how do you deal with the fear?" <laughs> so Ian David said, "Look, what what I did, of course, was after my house was overturned the first time. So he he's." hard drives his notes and everything was you know disappeared who knows who by but um he realized that he needed to 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 take a lot of material and lodge it elsewhere and with his lawyer and so a lot of material uh, a lot of names that don't get named in the first blue murder Mm. and all that material is lodged with his lawyer because he said i'm not scared of of dying per se i'm not scared of the cops or nettie smith coming after me and and murdering me i'm scared of how i'll be found Mm. you know uh that's full on isn't it you know writing is always difficult yeah Screenwriting, particularly, I think, because mm-hmm. it's such a um, such a crapshoot in this country. So mm-hmm. much of it is done on the smell of an oily rag, with no guarantee that anything's ever going to see the light of day or be commissioned, or you know. Um, but when you add in the possibility that you'll be offed mm-hmm. by your subject, yeah. or somebody associated or somebody with your so- subject, yeah, exactly. That, that's kind of a whole other level, isn't oh, it? Yeah. It really it, is. It, it is. Ro- Rogerson. Uh, was was as a as a child he was in the front page all the time yeah, yeah. with a shotgun in his hand breaking down doors and saving us from armed robs and 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 crims he 
was part of the the investigation. I, there was a something that was very f- well known in Sydney called the Hilton bombing. It was considered one of the first terrorist attacks where uh, there was a, a Chogham meeting and garbage men went to pick up the bins and someone had put a bomb in the bin, blown up, and some garbage men were killed on George Street. And so this one now has him uh, leading up to the crime where he murders, he and another man murder a student called Jamie Gow uh, over drugs. 2015. 2015. Yeah, yeah. And it follows that. And of course, uh, the performances are excellent. Tony Collette plays his second wife and uh, it's something that I can heartily recommend especially because you can watch it anytime it flips back and forth between the the first one and and this one in a way that that's very easy and it doesn't feel strained like they're striving for extra material mm. or anything it, it it's very well it's made it's pretty remarkable to have a character uh such as Rogerson mm. available to you with so much on the public record. Mm. You've got it. You've mm. got it as uh, it's almost like a gift to to the writers and the creators of this show and the actor and the actor. Roxbra- I'll come to Roxbra Roxbra. in a sec. But the, the the fact that so much of it is on the public record means you can say stuff. Yes, you can, you can actually recreate scenes that are that have been heard as testimony in court mm-hmm. without fear of being sued. Um, the fact that you've got this guy in jail means he's very unlikely to be able to get a defamation case against you. Yeah, you know, this puts it in a different space than say the uh, the Gina Reinhardt stuff, the 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 Hancock, yeah. uh, uh, um, miniseries or um, the House of Bond, say mm-hmm. you know where you've got these you've got real life characters mm. who have the potential to actually sue the pants off you yeah. for saying stuff that we all think and mm-hmm. we all perhaps think we know. Yeah. But once you put it there, as you know, as if it were the truth, yes. then you're really opening up the floodgates potentially. So the fact that so much is already on the record about Rogerson makes this a gift, really, because mm. it is a remarkable story. Well, he, he is tells, a remarkable. He character. tells a lot of that story himself, and, and he, for a while he was touring the country with yeah. Chopper Reed. <laughs> what a double act that would be! <laughs> and getting upset and not I bet getting they didn't enough. Get any bad reviews? <laughs> <laughs> not getting enough of the money, you know. <laughs> Mate, you said there'd be four hundred bucks in this. <laughs> yeah, Roxburgh is fantastic, he is, isn't, he? isn't he? Oh, it's just. I terrifying. love him in Rake, right? I yeah, love him in Rake. Right, yeah. This is so far from Rake. Oh, he is. I mean, I, I actually interviewed Roxburgh for okay. this, and I, this show, you this mean? show, yeah, yeah. and I, I, I put it to him that so much of the performance is about the stare. Mm-hmm. I mean, he just intimidates. He mm-hmm. he stares at people. He holds their gaze. He can charm with it, and he can he can just scare the bejesus out of people with it. And he told me that when when they did the first series back in ninety five, it took him a week to yeah. get hold of this thing. Yeah. And and he said Michael Jenkins <laughs> came up to me and said, "Mate, mate, what you did then was fantastic." <laughs> and he said, "What did I do? What did I do?" He said, "Nothing." <laughs> Well, and, then, and then he said, and you know, Michael will forgive me doing that voice if you ever talk to him. And I did a few days later. That's exactly what he sounds like. That's exactly what he sounds like. His, I think, it, for me, the thing that was most chilling was the way that New South Wales cops speak. There's a, there's a certain intonation, a certain rhythm. Mm. The, there's a clipped uh, consonants, and it's, and it's something that you, as a kid growing up you would hear when police would uh, give press conferences and, and yeah. make announcements and so on they spoke in a way that was completely different and that's i mean that's the whole thing about that job and about that code mm. and about that brotherhood is that it's a separate it's a separate life to real life with the real humans mm. and this whole thing that you get in in the first thing with the green light where nettie smith is is basically given carte blanche to do whatever he wants you know they they exist in a world that is adjacent to, but not not in their eyes, part of the world that you and I occupy. Mm. And his voice and his way, his diction, his way of speaking is not like Rogerson, but more than and and definitely chilling for me. A couple of interesting things about the the way that this show sort of surfaced. I mean, it's on a, it, it, it was commissioned by a commercial network, not which the is ABC. great. The first one was on great. the ABC. Yes. Right? Um, that's an interesting uh, development. I mean, it, it does suggest that to some degree the commercial networks are willing to take a few more risks than mm-hmm. maybe they were 22 years ago. Yeah. Uh, maybe. maybe. I, I would like to think so. That this Channel 7, uh, they, they give a great uh, coverage of the AFL. They should be congratulated for that. <laughs> but well done on them for doing this yeah. because at the same time they've got all this other stuff on there. Yeah, that, no, absolutely. You know, absolutely. Uh, um, 
I think the fact that Michael Jenkins uh, has basically resurfaced. Now, Michael Jenkins didn't just make Blue Murder back I in the know. 90s. He made Wild Side. Scales he made of Heartbreak Justice. High. Scales Alan of Kessel. Justice. Yep. Did some fantastic work. He was about as hot yes. as it got in the TV industry mm-hmm. back in the mid-90s. And then just sort of fell off the radar. When I talked to him, he told me about um, a, a TV series, a miniseries that Roxborough was going to be in and Hugo yeah. Weaving and co. It, w- it sounded amazing. Mm-hmm. 2004. Five, they were making this. It was about the Bali bombing. Right. right? Mm-hmm. Two part miniseries. The first part was going to be told as a police proce- procedural, the Australians in Bali dealing with the, the mop up and all the rest of it. Second part was going to be told entirely in Indonesian mm-hmm. from the perspective of the bombers. That is just such a bold premise, such a, like, a radical piece of mm. TV. It didn't happen because they were a week into filming it and the, the next wave, the 2005 wave of bombing happened in uh, uh, Bali yeah, yeah. and they basically got shut down yeah, right? and that was the okay. end of it and it's like wow what a missed opportunity that is what a mm. great piece of television that potentially would have been I mean you can never tell no. you know the greatest yeah. ideas don't always turn into the greatest the greatest output but it, it was just a you know a very bold piece of uh, you know con- conceptualization that I think it would have been wonderful to see and he's barely done anything since then you know so mm-hmm. he's now in his 70s and he's like right. come come out to make this piece and I think it's it, I, right. I think it's a really solid piece of work it's interesting that it aired in two parts on seven it's what probably three weeks ago now that it went to air the first episode I think got somewhere north of 750,000 viewers the second got about 550 I think so it dropped really significantly and when you talk about Seven mate, being bold enough to do a show like this, they probably won't rush to do another one because yeah. those numbers are not great. You know, yep. They're not sensational numbers. Uh, they're not terrible, but they're not they're not brilliant. They're better than Hell's Kitchen numbers. Yeah, they? well, that's right. That's right. And, um, which is a much safer sort of proposition for them in many respects. You look at what happened with the first Blue Murder in uh, when it went to air on the, on the ABC. The, it didn't air in New South Wales because there was still the, the appeals process. So it didn't air until six years later. When it went to air in New South Wales, it got something like 400,000 viewers just in New South Wales. Mm-hmm. So it got almost as many yeah. as the second episode got nationally this yeah. time around, which gives you an indication, I think, of how much the TV landscape has shifted. Like the free-to-air audience is basically just fracturing all over the place. So, you know, getting a show like this up is, is, is great. Um, I hope we see more of them because it is really kind of bold storytelling, great acting, great, good, solid scripting. But, you know... The numbers for this sort of thing just aren't there on free-to-air anymore, which is a real shame. So go watch Blue Murder one way or another, hopefully legally. (laughs) (laughs) We don't want to do anything illegal here.